the thought of three to six months to live, it just shattered me. I remember being put on a conference call with all of us. My dad was breaking the news to us. Um, I just remember crying. When you get that first call, um, that shakes you to your core. It was a shock. It was really devastating. Where you don't want to envision your life without this person. I mean, we've known each other since we were five. You know, it's like, no, this can't happen. It just can't happen. We got our affairs in order, and then the focus was just on, okay, what can I do? Whether it was exercising, eating healthy, researching, talking to people, absolutely anything in the world that I could do to try and give myself a better chance, that's what I did. My doctor said to me, CAR T is probably your best chance at survival right now. So at that moment, we decided to get right on to CAR T. To do CAR T, they pull T cells out of your body, genetically re engineer them in a facility, and then they, they transplant them back into your body. But there was a seven week delay, and my cancer was really growing aggressively. So we have a decision to make do we try and treat the cancer to slow it down, or do we hold out and try and get you to CAR T? The only thing that led me to a cure was CAR T, so we couldn't do anything to delay it. So they just flooded me with steroids and we waited three and a half weeks. The days could not go fast enough for me, for us. I mean, we were just like, all right, what do we do now? Like, we're doing puzzles, we're doing anything, anything to make the time go by, watching the clock, counting the days, counting the hours, you know? It was scary. So when we went in for the scan, as I laid down, I looked up at the ceiling and it was a green leafy ceiling. And for some reason, I was just overcome with this feeling of warmth. And I just, I came out of that scan knowing, I just knew it worked. I don't know why, I can't explain it. But I just had a feeling it worked. Not only was it the result that we had hoped for, but it was per usual with my father exceeding expectations. He was fully cancer free after 30 days of CAR T. And it took a couple hours to really settle in. Um, but the, the first thing I did was start sobbing and, and hugging him. I've never felt that type of emotion before. Thinking back on your entire life and realizing that, you know, you're gonna have more time. To know that he won this fight like he told us he would, um, it was just another impossible promise that he had kept. I speak to four or five patients a week, every single week as a mentor, to help them through it, to help them make the decision to do it and what it means. This is a treatment that saved, saved my life. There are now 19,000 people in the United States that have had it. Okay? And there should be so many more. And one of my personal objectives is to make this treatment more available to people in Rhode Island because it's not right now. Thank you, Liz. The Chamber is so incredibly fortunate to have you leading the way amplifying voices for so many members in this room. I am so honored to be here tonight. Now, we've all been to a million dinners like this, so I think you can tell from the opening video, tonight's speech is going to be a little bit different. Please just bear with me as I try and tell you the story of how my personal circumstances dramatically changed. How now it altered the course of my professional life, driving me to give back even more to the community that supported me and teaching me a valuable life lesson along the way. The two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. To paraphrase from Mark Twain, my journey of illness and recovery taught me how to look to passion to choose a path in life. But before I talk about my life in remission, I actually want to go back a little bit 
to my illness. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was my first day of getting chemo treatment, and I was in a fog. Like, I couldn't believe that this was happening to me. I was really down. And then my phone rang, and it was Speaker Joe Shikarchi. And he said, Mark, we're with you. State of Rhode Island's behind you, and we want to name some legislation after you. That legislation is known as the Mark A. Christopher Economic Development Act of 2021. And Governor McKee signed that law. As you can tell from the picture, right after you signed it, you gave me the pen. Well, I still have it, Governor, so thank you. So now back to my life in remission. We passed the law, and I think, okay, this is great. I'm healthy. Let's get back to work. And I go back to work as if nothing changed. So I returned to Bally's as an executive, and actually one of my first duties was to preside over the topping off ceremony at the expansion here in Lincoln that was enabled by the Mark A. Christopher Act. And so I did my duty. Governor, you were there. We do our speeches. And it was a really proud moment for me. And yet, it just didn't feel the same. Something was off. And I can't really describe it. And so I was talking to my therapist about it. And I was explaining to her kind of what's going on in my mind. And she said to me, Mark, what if I told you that the stress and daily grind of a full-time global executive position gave you a 1% more likely chance that you would have a relapse of cancer? Would you still do it? And then she said, what if I told you you only had 12 months to live? How would you want to spend your time? And she said, you know, Mark, I can't promise you that we have the answers to those questions. Those questions haunted me. What haunted me even more was the number 44%. So at the time I had CAR T-cell, it was a relatively new treatment, and they only had four years' worth of data. What that data showed was that 44% of the people who had that treatment, like me, survived four years. So that's an awesome number if your perspective is these are people that had no other options in life. They were out of chances. So to get a 44% chance to survive is great. At the same time, it's a terrifying number because that means 56% of the people who had it like me didn't survive four years. And as I was processing all of this, I realized you know what, this isn't how I want to spend my time. The thing I'm most passionate about in life is my family, and I want to spend every moment I possibly can with them. So at the age of 52, I retired. And retirement was so much fun. I got to spend time with my family, we traveled, we did all kinds of great things. I was doing everything possible to enjoy every moment of my life. You know, when I was sick, I said to my kids, if I get through this, any experience in the world that you want to have with me, we will do. Cost, don't worry about it. So my daughter, Gabby, ever the wanderlust daughter, said, let's go to Antarctica. So we went south, okay? It was the most amazing trip, okay? We created a lifetime of memories. One of the things that was most memorable was the polar plunge, okay? So icebergs around us, snow flurries falling, and Gabby and I jumped off the boat into the Southern Ocean below the Antarctic Circle Line. In fact, Gabby told me that we crossed the Antarctic Circle Line a year ago today. And that made seven continents for both of us. Now, I also happen to have a lot of photos of the polar plunge, but while you're eating dinner, no one wants to see me in a bathing suit, so let's just skip right over that. So back to my life, you know, in remission. So I'm going to the doctor all the time. I have a million checkups, and, you know, with every appointment comes anxiety and then relief. And with the passage of time, I started to realize, you know what? I'm feeling good. I'm healthy. My confidence is growing. 
And I started to think, you know, maybe I'm too young to do nothing. And then this esteemed gentleman sitting at this table right over here said to me, Mark, I got a great idea. It's the governor, by the way. He said, I got a great idea. Why don't you come chair the 195 commission and get more involved in my administration? And I loved the idea. I said yes right away. So give me a little diversion here on 195 just for a moment. Um, first of all, the executive director is Karen Skunik, and she's joined by Amber and Serena at the table with the governor, and they are just a fantastic team. So the 195 commission, listen, I know we're in northern Rhode Island, I get geography, but I think we all agree that a vibrant capital city is good for the entire state. So the mission of the commission is to, is to create neighborhoods, drive investment, and foster economic development. And, you know, usually when municipalities or regions are developing a neighborhood like this, it takes 20 to 25 years. So we're right at about the halfway point, but we've got a lot of momentum. And the state's priorities are our priorities. So you hear the governor, the speaker, and the Senate president talk about housing all the time. So we've got 1,000 housing units in Providence that are built, under construction, or in plan. Okay. And just to give you some context on the number, that's two-thirds of all of the housing units being developed in Providence. But we set ourselves another goal because we keep hearing that there's a housing crisis in the state, so we're going to do another 1,000 units over the next five years. So all I've said is done, 2,000 housing units in the city of Providence. You hear another priority that gets talked about a lot, and that's life sciences. The governor already mentioned it, the life sciences hub. We work very closely with Neil Steinberg and that new board to make sure all of our efforts are coordinated so we can deliver the best results for Rhode Island. So now that we've talked about that a little bit, let me just kind of flip through very quickly a few of our projects that we're really excited about. So the first is the State Health Lab. The governor already mentioned this. It's under construction today. I can't tell you what a big win this is for the state. Mostly funded by the CDC, we'll have a state-of-the-art Department of Health lab, and we'll have 100,000 square feet available for commercial use. This is the centerpiece of the life sciences cluster that we're trying to build in Providence. But there are so many other projects that we're proud of. So, for example, Parcel 6 and Trader Joe's, right? It's got housing, including affordable housing, workforce housing, and a grocery store. Part of, one of our priorities was to try and deliver a supermarket into the neighborhood. Another priority was daycare. So parcel nine is now under construction right now. It'll have 135 units and a daycare center. And there are so many more projects that we're excited about. Parcel 1A in the upper left is a 10 three-bedroom condo building, accomplishes another one of our priorities, which is enabling home ownership. Up on the right, it's parcel 14 and 15, that's a 150-unit residential tower that will enable a Brown master plan to deliver two commercial buildings once that one's done. And on the bottom is parcel two, which is on South Main Street, next to Plant City, 190 housing units. So we are really excited to watch these projects develop and advance in 2024, but we're already thinking about the future. So parcel five, which is here on the right in green, abuts Wickenden Street. It's a signature parcel right in front of the laborers building, for those of you that are familiar with it. We've now cultivated a lot of interest in this, so we're going to issue an RFP this spring and see what we can build. And parcel 35 on the left in blue is a site that we've now put aside for RIPTA for them to explore for their new terminal. The thought of transportation-oriented development and a brand new state-of-the-art modern terminal, a complex that has amenities, that has housing, that has all of the things that it should have in the 21st century, is really exciting. So we're going to see how RIPTA does with its study. But we know at 195 our mission is so much more than just economic development. It's about improving the quality of life. So we focus on outdoor spaces as well. We opened the Bally's event lawn last year. Thank you, Bally's. Right? And we completed the Coastal Greenway, which allows people to now walk an entire loop around the river, and there's so much more to come. We are really focused on 195 District Park. So for those of you that don't know, the park is a gem, okay? Seven acres right on the water, 
Last year, we hosted over 130 events. We averaged 5,000 visitors a day, a million and a half visitors a year. And we're just scratching the surface on what we can do there because we're going to go into the ground this year to build a pavilion. And that pavilion's going to have two great Rhode Island brands, the Guild and Seven Stars. We're also going to have public restrooms and we're going to have Wi-Fi. We want to do everything possible to try and invest in that neighborhood. Look, I could talk about 195 all day, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stop here. Suffice it to say, I think the 195 district has a terrific future, and we are prepared to do everything possible to impact the economy in our state. But I've got to tell you, coming back to me, that getting involved with 195 kind of lit my fire a little bit. It caused me to say, okay, I'm hungry. I want to do more. What should I do? So I started getting involved with some local businesses. Let's start with Linden Group. The CEO and founder is here, Mindy Penny. She is just an extraordinary entrepreneur. It's a woman-owned business based in East Providence, construction supply and rebar, exactly the lifeblood of the Northern Rhode Island Chamber and the small business economy we're trying to build here in the state. Then I joined the board of Priority, which is a public company based in Georgia in the payment space. I also joined the board of a private payments company called um, Pavilion in Las Vegas. So this was all great. I was getting my activities levels up. I was feeling good. And then Bally saw this and said, well, what about us? Come back to Bally's. And I said, well, I'm not ready to come back full time, but I was honored to be appointed as the chair of the Bally's Rhode Island board, right? And the Bally's team is here today, and you can see them all, Craig Eaton, Craig Skoulos, Kim Ward, Patty Doyle. We've been through the fires together. They mean so much to me. Craig Eaton actually drove me to one of my chemo treatments. That's how special the people at Bally's are. So getting back into Bally's in a limited capacity was great for me. So allow me to just take a little bit of a diversion on Bally's. Bally's, everyone knows it's a global gaming company headquartered here in Rhode Island. They have all sorts of awesome things going on. Let's just talk about a couple of them. So first is Las Vegas. So Bally's owns the Tropicana on the Strip. It is announced it's tearing it down so they can build a stadium to allow the Oakland A's to relocate to Las Vegas. And then once the Oakland A's move there, Bally's will lead the effort to develop a casino next to it. I mean, that's just groundbreaking stuff, all from a local Rhode Island company that really started right here in Lincoln, okay? Another thing for Bally's is Chicago. They want a hotly contested RFP process to build a casino in downtown Chicago. They've already opened the temporary facility, and later this year, they'll go into the ground on the $1.7 billion permanent facility. But let's come closer to home. On Friday, we'll be soft launching iGaming here in Rhode Island. iGaming allows people to play table games or slots remotely in a regulated manner. Once again, Rhode Island is on the cutting edge. They'll be only the seventh state in the country to allow iGaming. iGaming was enacted by legislation last year, really championed by the Senate President, Dominic Ruggiero, supported by the Speaker and the Governor. And we wouldn't be able to launch without all of our partners in the McKee administration, the lottery led by Director Furcolo, revenue led by Director Verdi, and of course our partners at IGT. Okay. But even more than that, Bally's is so focused locally. So last year, we made a pledge to give CCRI $5 million over five years. It's the biggest gift in the history of CCRI. So why did we do it? Because we're focused on higher education. We agree with the governor that we need to raise revenues in the state. And enabling them to create a new curriculum around gaming, hospitality, and internet security will create great jobs for Rhode Islanders. So as I looked at my Bally's experience and I think about the role with CCRI, it made me realize something else that I'm really passionate about. And Liz mentioned this in the beginning, and that is Rhode Island. So I serve on a number of nonprofits here in Rhode Island. One I just want to call attention to quickly is Always Learning. So this is the new nonprofit formed to try and help advance Governor, McKee, Governor McKee's Learning 365 agenda. I also need to give a shout out just to Tom Giordano from the partnership who's here. The partnership is an exceptional nonprofit that really does cutting edge, leading things to try and propel our state forward. 
If you don't know about it, I encourage you to take a look. So now I've got the nonprofits in, and I'm just looking for more things that I'm passionate about. What drives me? And I just, it's never ending. And I realized one thing that I was always passionate about, and I still had a passion for, was the law. So I had the good fortune of growing up as a young lawyer in Providence. That's where I started my career. And at that time, you know, I used to go to lunch all the time with two other young lawyers, one guy named Steve Zubiago and another a guy named Mike Prescott. We would eat at this place called Fast Eddie's on Doran Street, for those of you that know Providence, right? And we would fantasize about the fact that one day we're all going to work together. Well, it took almost 30 years, but we finally got there. So I've now joined Nixon Peabody as well. My new colleagues from Nixon Peabody are sitting right over there at the table, including Steve Zubiago, who's now the global managing partner um, of Nixon Peabody. So people, when they ask me what I do, I tell them I'm retired, and they laugh, right? And then they say, well, do you have an office? And I'm like, actually, I have three. 195, Bally's, and Nixon Peabody. And I love all of it. I'm having so much fun. I'm really enjoying it. But actually, the one that I'm most passionate about, about what I do right now, is CAR T-cell mentoring and advocacy. You heard a little bit about the treatment in the video, so I'm not going to go over it again. But I have the privilege of being able to speak to other patients who are about to go through what I went through. And while each of those conversations is unique and deeply personal, they all have some common themes. We're always talking about their hopes and fears and about how to cope. And I try and provide them support as they're about to go through what might be the most difficult moments of their life. I encourage them to try and remember that you have to deal with the mind as well as the body. And despite all of the odds you're facing, try and focus on a positive outlook. I will forever be grateful to Lifespan and Dana-Farber for the care that they gave me. And as I speak to people around the country, I realize that we are so incredibly fortunate to be in one of the world's most advanced healthcare corridors. I just want to do more in Rhode Island related to CAR-T. But you know, as has happened to probably every single person in this room, cancer then hit my family again. My mom. She had her own stage four diagnosis last year. Actually, things were really rough. I had to say goodbye to her when I was in Antarctica. Fortunately, she's still here today, and she's doing exceptionally well at 80 years old. You know, my mom and I have always had a terrific relationship, but now we share a bond as cancer survivors that I never imagined we would. And coming back to Mark Twain's quote, I finally know why I'm here. It's about my family. And it starts with Melissa. So Melissa, and I fell in love with Melissa in elementary school. To be exact, the Francis J. Varrier Elementary School in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. In the third grade, I spray painted on my parents' boiler, Mark and Missy forever. But spelled like a true Rhode Islander, the number four and then E-V-A with a heart around it. I loved her then and I've loved her every day since. You know, when this all happened, she was there with me by my side every step of the way. She referred to it as our diagnosis. To say that she helped me through this is an understatement. She carried me through it. It's one of those things that I will never, ever forget. You know, when you go through a moment like this, everyone applauded me for being positive and optimistic. 
And I'm proud of the fact that I was most of the time, but you can't help but have terrible moments. You just can't be on 100%. And if you're ever talking to anybody who's in that situation, be patient with them when they have the low moments and try and help pull them out of it. I remember my deepest fears. My wife, Melissa, was so young. What if she's alone? Would she be alone for decades? I would hope she would find someone. My daughter, Gabby, I've always thought about her wedding day. What if I'm not there for it? What will that mean for her? How could I not walk her down the aisle? My boys, Sam and Jake, all of their life moments, getting married, having children, becoming fathers. You know, I lost my father right after I turned 50, and I still miss him terribly but I was fortunate to have him through most of my adulthood. I simply could not bear the thought of my children having to experience that loss so prematurely. But guess what? That was then and this is now. I'm healthy, I'm two years plus in remission, I feel great and I'm looking forward to some great moments. And top of the list are two weddings. So my son Sam is marrying Gabby Riggio, and my daughter Gabby is marrying Jake O'Connor, and then I've got a son Jake. So Sam's marrying Gabby, Gabby's marrying Jake, and I've got a Jake. The names don't work, I know. I, you know, there's nothing I could do. I tried to raise them well, but there's only so far I can take them. So, Sam and Gabby are getting married in Martha's Vineyard in September. Gabby and Jake are getting married in Italy in June of 2025. Two completely different weddings, and yet they both have one thing in common. The future partners for my children are exceptional people. They are loving, they are caring, they are wonderful, and we are just so thrilled to welcome them into the family. They've also given me another job now, though. I am the official wedding planner for both weddings. And I have to tell you, I'm having so much fun. Like, I just love it. And I can't even begin to tell you the joy I feel in thinking about the fact that I'm going to be able to experience these special moments in life. But I've got to tell you, my journey also taught me something else. It doesn't always have to be special moments. You can just enjoy the simple things in life, and they can provide you just as much fulfillment. I think about my youngest son, Jake. He just moved back to Rhode Island from Charleston, South Carolina this past summer, and it's so wonderful having him home again, just being able to see him. You know, we go to a million Patriots games. We've done that our whole life. The team sucks and needs the fist. But that's a whole different story, right? It's just so great having him home. And I get to spend every single day with the love of my life, Melissa. I simply couldn't be more fortunate. You know, when I think about all of the angst caused by my illness, despite all of that, and this is very hard to say, it was a blessing in disguise because it's taught me to appreciate the things that are most important in life. So I want to thank all of you for allowing me to share my story, and particularly to thank those of you in the audience that played in a part in it. Have a good night.